Welcome. I know how to stop deforestation. I'm a forester. I spent most of my career, all my career, planting trees, looking after trees, and promoting sustainable management of forests. What that means is growing forests and also cutting them down so that you can provide the timber around the walls, the podium I'm standing on, the MDF that's in your little tables, and the purlins that are holding up the ceiling. This is sustainable forest management. Deforestation is the opposite of this. Deforestation is about destroying trees, about destroying forests, and about destroying biodiversity. My idea is a simple one. It's about planting forests. It's about turning problem makers into problem solvers. It's about turning the destroyers of forests into the creators of forests, and it's a growing idea. Now, in order to combat deforestation, you first have to understand its extent and its causes. In the decade to 2000, some 80 million hectares of forests were destroyed globally. That's 12 times the area of Tasmania. Now, I use Tasmania because if one tree falls in the southwest forests, as a nation, we all know about it. But in the decade to 2000, 12 times the total land area of Tasmania was destroyed with hardly a whimper. There are three main causes of deforestation. Clearing for cattle ranching, clearing for oil palm plantations, and most of you will have heard about that, and of course, illegal logging. But society is making a difference. With eyes in the sky, we're putting a stop to clearing for wall-to-wall -wall agriculture. We're pulling the reins on clearing for oil palm plantations. And with timber certification, product labeling, and chain of custody, we're constricting the timber products market such that it be it's becoming impossible for illegally harvest timbered to be sold and processed. So society is making a difference. And if you don't have a satellite and you own a logging company, what you do is take the wheels off your trucks so that the robbers can't steal your trucks and steal your timber. Very practical. So society is making a difference, and in the decade to 2010, just two years ago, we, as a, uh, the world, cleared some 50 million hectares of forests. That's only 7.6 Tasmanias. Well done, world. <laughs> but this is a gross statistic, and it hides the real problem. And this is, this is the detail behind that statistic. That statistic is actually made up of 40 million hectares of reforestation. Almost all of it is in temperate zone countries. Most of it is in China. The downside is that more than 80 million hectares of forests were destroyed. And they were destroyed in tropical and subtropical countries. Deforestation is a tropical disease. Deforestation is causing the loss of tropical forests, unique tropical ecosystems, and unique tropical biodiversity. But the other scary statistic is that half of tropical deforestation is caused by subsistence farmers. These are not corporates who are clearing for oil palm plantations or cattle ranches. These are small farmers with no choice. They have no choice if they want to provide a future for their families. Now, I want to take you to a place where tropical rainforests and small farmers collide. It's in Sulawesi, and most of you will know being in Darwin that Sulawesi is not very far from here, and that's in Indonesia. And I want to introduce you to a young man for the sake of anonymity. We'll call him Dindin. 
Now, Din Din grew up on the coast in a small fishing community. His family owned a boat, very little money, hand-to-mouth existence, fishing, especially with declining fishing stocks. Din Din grew up. He, there was nothing, no assets left in the family to distribute amongst the children. He had no job, has no future, no welfare support. And as a strong, uh, handsome young man, he got married, fell in love, got married, and had a child on the way. Now, Dindin had no future. He had no future on the coast. So he headed for the hills. And in the hills he found logging tracks, tracks that logging companies had made in the forest concessions. It's the easiest way to get into the forest. There he followed those logging tracks and he found a gap in the forest, a gap where the logging companies had harvested, selectively harvested a large tree, taken it away for processing. And he occupied that gap because it's the easiest place to start clearing the forest. In that gap, there are young trees growing, competing. This is the idea of sustainable forest management. When you take a tree out, you stimulate regrowth, regeneration, and forest regeneration. Just like Dindin, these saplings were growing, for, looking for space, growing for sunlight and water, and growing space. So Dindin made a start and he cut down those saplings, built himself a small dwelling, built himself a platform to sleep on, and set about clearing, tidying up the rest of the clearing. Once the debris was on the ground, he lit a couple of small fires. These are not great conflagrations. These are small, smoky fires that creep through the landscape. They're creeping through the landscape. They kill the young rainforest germinating shoots. Rainforest seeds are very vulnerable, not like eucalypts, and they burn and die very easily. And these fires changed, they converted the forest debris into ash. Now that ash is then the essential fertilizer for Dindin's food garden. In the first year he cleared two hectares, enough for a small dwelling, enough for a food garden, enough for this essential cash crop that he needed to raise money, to sell the crop, to raise money so he could feed clothe and school his family. The second year, a brother and a cousin came and together they increased the clearing to about 10 hectares. In the third year, more family members came and they increased the clearing to 50 hectares. Now the same thing was happening further up the slope, across the valley, over the top of the mountain range, on the next island hundreds of small clearings, thousands of fires, and millions of hectares of forest lost. People like Dindin, or Dindin and his like, are clearing the forests of West Sulawesi at around 5% per annum. You say, oh, 5%, that's not much. But what it means is that in 20 years, there's no forest left. Within Dindin's lifespan, there are no forests, there will be no forests left in West Sulawesi. This is a moral dilemma. It's not just an ecological dilemma, it's a moral dilemma. If you ask yourselves what would you do faced with Dindin's dire circumstances, would you find it acceptable just to cut down a few small trees just so you could grow, a few, grow some crops so you could feed your family? That sounds acceptable. And this is a paradox. This is what I call the Dindin paradox. We have to protect the forest and protect freedoms. It sounds impossible to resolve. It's, that's what a paradox is. It sounds impossible to resolve. But there is a solution. And it goes like this. If the trees are being cut down, we replant them. If the, if the people cutting down the trees are cutting them down for economic reasons, we pay them to replant them. And those trees that are, the trees that are planted then provide protection against deforestation of the remaining forest. They provide timber for a rejuvenated timber industry. 
and importantly, they can provide woody biomass for renewable biomass electricity. This is the idea, and this requires investment. So this is a public-private partnership, and it requires two levels of investment to change this, to make a change, to break the Dindin paradox. The first is private investment, and private investment to create the planted forests. And the, as I said, the planted forests will physically protect the remaining forests. They provide new timber for new timber industries and renewable electricity. And the public side of the public-private partnership is required to provide education, training, and infrastructure uh, to support that investment. And this is how the investment works, the timing of it. It starts with regional engagement. Regional engagement means establishing good governance. Good governance quite simply means putting in place structures that eliminate corruption from the project. With corruption under control, you provide an environment in which investors will invest because they are confident that they will get a return, more likely to get a return on their investment. That investment provides sustainable forest landscapes by planting new, newly planted forests. Those newly planted forests provide timber for the new timber industries and they provide renewable energy. The renewable energy is an enabling development. It enables value adding. It enables the timber industry to get going, but it also enables processing of small crops like cocoa and corn. It's a huge game-changing innovation for the province. And this is the one innovation that's carrying the project. Together with, these, the, with the enhanced value chain, together they increase regional prosperity. Regional prosperity then leads to innovation and innovation beyond the limits of natural capital, beyond sunlight, soil, the limits of sunlight, soil and water. And it's innovation that is based on human intellect and the drive for a better standard of living, which is common amongst all people. We started such a project in West Sulawesi. It's called Sulba Habitat. Sulba means Sulawesi Barat or West Sulawesi. It's about sustainable forests and sustainable futures. It's about forests. It's about protecting the forests from deforestation. It's about people most importantly, because people cause the deforestation. It's about employing people, giving them a future, giving them meaningful, a meaningful jobs in sustainable forests. And it's about carbon, because once the world sorts itself out and establishes a, a viable and reliable carbon trading system, then the communities involved in this will be able to get revenue from the carbon saved from avoiding deforestation. We've spent four years getting to this point and we've signed, completed a 17-party memorandum of understanding for Sulbar Habitat. That's with the, the memorandum of understanding includes the national government, the provincial government, the regency governments, the forest concession holders and the NGOs. And it's been to get to this point, it's been about managing expectations. And this is not unique to this project. Many of you will, this, this will resonate with many of you who are involved in projects or any business development. You start off with a good idea. <laughs> expectations become stratospheric. Everyone's expecting a quick buck. The horn of plenty will be opened and flow. But in very short time, and it is a very short time, <laughs> Expectations crash and they fall below the point at which you entered. And this, unsurprisingly, is when a lot of people give up and walk away. But if you persist, if you believe in what you're trying to do, if you become part of the landscape, if you become part of the furniture, then confidence is built, rebuilt, and over a period of time, you get to a point where you can complete a 17-party memorandum of understanding. 
and you have enormous support, and that's deep and wide support. It also means that next year we will be able to start a pilot project that will see trees put back in the landscape of West Sulawesi for the first time. We're persistent because we're passionate about the forests of West Sulawesi. And we're persistent because we're passionate about the three game-changing drivers of deforestation. New jobs planting new forests to protect remaining virgin forests. New jobs in new timber industries, revitalized timber industry, and renewable energy to support economic growth. This is a triple synergy. It's a triple synergy for sustainable development. It's a triple synergy for Dindin's future. And it's a triple synergy for sustainable forest landscapes. If we are successful, the forests of West Sulawesi will no longer die the death of millions of cuts. They will get new life by millions of new trees. Thank you. <laughs>